We are clergy, and that's mm -hmm. why we can offer this. We are not medical health professionals. None of what I'm talking to y'all about should constitute medical advice. It cannot constitute medical advice. Um, so, right. yeah. By law, none of this is medical advice. Also, side note, none of this constitutes medical advice. However, all of it is covered under religious freedom, which means that even if your state has problems with what we're saying, they can fuck off because they can't tell us we don't get to say it. It's actually one of the reasons why we're providing this class is we found out that a lot of other churches provide sex education classes and do so in a manner that we um, disagree with, but it's protected under their rights as a religion. So we were like, okay, so then it's protected for us too, even in states that only permit abstinence-only education. Yeah, we're, we're stealing a page from the Satanic Temple. Right, um. so... Or satanic church. I guess. We're going to start today talking about male and female brains. So you probably, if you grew up anywhere in Western dominant culture, have heard the idea that there are male brains and female brains. That female brains are better at multitasking, <gasps> that male brains are better at, you know, direct aggressive competition, that male brains are better at directions, that female brains are better at emotional reasoning. Um, however, the most recent, recent study says that, um, most recent studies, sorry, plural, um, that there are, if you sort of divide for the sex differences, that people are like, oh, well, male brains do this and female brains do this. If you divide that, very few people actually firmly sit in having a male brain or very firmly sit in having a female brain. And then it's not actually matched up to right. um, gender identity or to assigned gender at birth. So you can have someone who has everything that we associate with a male brain, but they may be a cisgendered, assigned female at birth, non-intersex, ident you know, identifies as a woman, but has what we call a male brain. But even then, that's rare. So, Most people don't divide. Yeah, what it boils down to is that you cannot divide brain activity into two distinct categories cleanly and um, ex and degree to which an individual brain fa um, falls into either category is not correlated in a statistically significant way with assigned gender at birth or gender identity. So the theory had gone for a very, very long time that as soon as a fetus developed testicles, um, the fetus would start to have more um, heavy testosterone balance and that this would somehow masculinize the brain and divide us into having two different types of brain. However, if you look at brain scans, um, the uh, brain regions are one of the things that they felt would be different, that you could look at the hippocampus, that you could look at the inferior frontal gyrus um, and say, all right, looking at how the brain <coughs> is physically structured we'll find that there are male and female brains, right? Looking at how it's physically structured, nope. Um, they, uh, they found that very, very few people had half of all the brain features they might be expected to have um, based on their, on their sex. So not even, not even, like most people didn't even have half of, of the, the brain structures brain that you would have. Um, and only between zero and 8% of people had all male or all female brains. Zero and 8%.
Um, that means that averaged across many people, um, you may find that there are some sex also, differences in brains. Yeah, can I, for, for those who have not formally studied statistics, um, one, I suggest that you do is incredibly helpful for like understanding news and lies. Um, but what a what an interval of zero to eight percent means is basically we found typically it'll be right in the middle. So four percent of brains fell into this category. And based on the number of people we studied, we estimate that the actual number overall in the population is between 0 and 8. There's some error there from the fact that we didn't study everyone. Um, but if you look at any in given, individual, look at any given individual, their brain structure will not be what we have said is a male brain structure or a female brain structure. Now it actually goes on from here because that's just the size of a region. Um, this is literally like take this out of the brain pan and look at it and measure shit and you're going to find that people by and large do not have a male brain or a female brain. It gets better. So then there's another study, other studies, because um, there, there's been more than one now, that looked at neural activity. That oh, looked at that how the brain lights up in response to different <coughs> stressors. So you can actually watch the emotional region of the brain or the memory region of the brain light up. Um, and they found that once again, if you sort of sorted by the myths of our, of our population and how everything divides by gender and said, okay, these are male characteristics. They're better at short term planning. They're better at, um, they're better at logic. They're better at math. They're more aggressive. They're, um, they have more activity in the logic centers. And if you looked at the, the ideas of what a female brain would have, they're more emotional. They're, they have, um, um, basically what they found is, again, it doesn't divide that way. Um, and here's something really, really interesting. If before people went in to the tests, they were reminded <coughs> of how they were supposed to react along gendered lines, then the tests aligned better with whether they had a male brain or a female brain. You had to tell them that they were supposed to be better at something, that they were supposed to have more neural activity in a certain region. And then they found that if they took the, the brain scans to people, not the ones from um, when they were told to react along gender lines, but they, if you took the brain scans, the original ones of neural activity, and you gave them to other scientists and you said, sort these into male and female brains, they sorted them wrong almost every time because it turns out that people who are designated female at birth are told that they are more emotional and no they're not um we're just told that we are there's actually a third study i'm going to bring up and uh, i know i'm i'm really beating this point but I've been told all my life that men and women are just different and male brains and female brains don't work the same and that I'm resisting the goddess inside of me by being like, no, fuck you. My brain works like my brain, not like a woman's right. brain. I don't have a special lady brain. Is it pink? Right. So will it be pink? If let's talk about it? neuroplasticity and what we're learning about neuroplasticity. Oh man, neuroplasticity so, is amazing, first of all. Basically, um. brains change, and they change much, much faster than we think that they do. Um, and the structure of our brains and our neurotransmitter reactions and the hormone balance of our brains changes from minute to minute to minute to minute. And the mosaic of features that can be observed in the brain at any given moment is not it, like it doesn't work the way we thought it did. So originally we said, okay, there's a characteristically male, like assigned male at birth, <coughs> density of dendritic spines or branches of a nerve cell, um, and that there are, um, there's a different way that this looks like in, in a woman's brain, assigned female at birth. Nope. Turns out that you can have a conversation with someone and have their brain switch. You can literally talk with someone 
and have their brain change in the moment from what we have associated with characteristically male brains to a characteristically female brain. It's social. Um, you'll also, so it's social based and it's also use based. You'll find the people who work in essentially fields that require high levels of logic based problem solving will shockingly develop more structures in their brain associated with logic based problem solving and will have a tendency yeah. to have that be what appears on their brain scans. Short it's and long term experiences literally <clears throat> change the brain's structure. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with brain structure is we're saying, hey, these jobs are better suited to men, right? And so people who are assigned male at birth get those jobs, right? You get male dominated fields and then their brains literally change to, to better accommodate that field. And then we look at those brains and we go, oh, this must just be what male brains are like. No, no, it's what the field is like. And they found that this happens in long term and short term. So social attitudes and expectations like stereotypes can change your brain structure and how your brain processes information. Um, and also cognitive skills that you acquire over time can change your brain structure. They are finding that even if you look at different cultures, the brain structure is different. Um, so for example, in Russia, doctors, then the brain skills, the cognitive skills that we associate with being a physician, that's actually a female dominated field in Russia. And it's very underpaid because they said, oh, well, women are more likely to want to care for the sick and care for the dying. And they pay teachers the way we pay doctors and they pay doc and teachers are a male dominated field over there. And they pay doctors very, very poorly. If you were to look at the doctor structure, the doctor structure in Russia versus America, you would find similarities despite most doctors in Russia being assigned female at birth and most doctors in America being assigned male at birth. It has nothing to do with what gender you were assigned at birth or your genitalia structure. It has to do with the cognitive skills that you are um, developing. They have found that it is much easier to understand brains and how the structures work and how neuroplasticity works to search by culture and skill set rather than by gender. Um, yeah. So uh, just an interesting thing. And they're finding that it changes in the moment. Yeah. That if you remind someone what their gender role is, their neuroplasticity responds. I'm gonna be a massive nerd here for a second. Okay. Your brain is essentially hardware that is capable of rewriting the firmware. It's firmware on the fly to optimize for specific problems. Um, and specific um, problem-solving skill sets. It, it's kind of amazing that it does this level of self-optimization, um, but it also optimizes for what it's supposed to do, um, which is where the social stereotypes come into play. Now, let's talk psychologically, because we've talked structure, neuroactivity, neuroplasticity. Um, so there have been several studies completed in the last few years uh, of behavioral and personality traits to sort of figure out, well, like, all right, what is a female personality and what is a male personality? And they found, again, you cannot allocate by gender identity. <coughs> it doesn't work. There are women who are aggressive and rapid thinkers and rapid problem solvers and who are forthright and direct and brisk and very good at logic. And there are men who are emotional and caring and sweet and better at long-term yes. planning and all the things that get sorted into yeah. like, this is what it means to be a woman and this is what it means to be a man, don't apply psychologically either. And once again, if you remind people of what their gender role is, what, what appropriate personality characteristics they're supposed to have before they go in, well, that changes their behavior. So lastly, we're gonna talk about hormones. 
I know, I know. Male and female brains. This is taking up a long chunk of our class. But you can't do a sex education class before you get past the myth of, well, men are just a certain way and women are just a certain way. So let's talk testosterone versus estrogen. So we already belabored the point in our first class that <coughs> the idea that a person running around with a penis always has a higher testosterone balance than a person running around with a vagina is false. Um, that in fact, you need all of them. Everyone possesses testosterone, estrogen, and other sex hormones unless they have some kind of a, a hormonal disorder, in which case they may just not produce any of it, or they may have to take, you know, if you can't make your own store-bought is fine. Um, if you can afford it, welcome to America. But basically, those hormones are just part of the body's instruments. It's part of how the body handles building itself, handles change, handles stressors. Um, the really relevant one here is that you probably think you know what testosterone does. But you don't. And you're probably wrong. So, something to know is that A, um, testosterone and estrogen are actually very similar to each other. Their difference is very, very little chemically. Um, somewhat similar to the difference between honey and sugarcane. And one actually starts off as, as itself and then gains chemicals in the body and becomes the other. Um, so they actually have the same chemical root. Uh, now, um, something to know about testosterone balance in say, um, if you have a uterus, if you have a vagina, if you have a clitoris, a high testosterone balance in someone who has a uterus, vagina, and clitoris actually makes the uterus, the vagina, and the clitoris healthier. Um, it prolongs estrus, it makes the clitoris more sensitive, um, but, uh, it doesn't do what people think. People think that once you get testosterone, higher testosterone balance, it makes you more aggressive. That's what people think. So let's talk about what it actually does. Hormones affect aggression in people, primarily in four ways. Motivation, by acting on the central nervous system at a receptor in a particular loci. Um, they may alter the cues that our body, you're being asked if you want tea. They may alter the cues that our body puts off to other people. Pheromones, vocal cues, visual signals, a bunch of stuff that you don't even know you're doing. Um, they've observed Unless this, do, like um, if it turns out that your mm -hmm. eyes dilate and your nostrils flare and the, the pattern of blood on your cheeks changes and people actually process that information on a level they're not aware they're processing. Well, generally. And this is used in social communication. The incidence or intensity of competing behaviors, please pay attention to that one because it's very important. The incidence or intensity of competing behaviors, or they vary the sensitivity that you have to the sensory signals being put out by other people. So all those sensory signals I just said that you start having, you also get more sensitive to the ones that other people have towards you. Or less, depending on yeah. which way it's dialing. So hormones <clears throat> affect aggression in those four ways. Um, and those four ways vary from person to person. But in particular, what's always been assumed is that testosterone makes people A, have a higher sex drive, and B, be more aggressive. Those are the two things that we've heard about testosterone over and over and over again. And we're wrong. We've, we've been wrong. We've actually been wrong for a while. Um, well, testosterone. We've known that we were wrong for yes, a while. Yes, we've known that we're wrong, we've been wrong for a while. That. Testosterone increases competition. So back from when we diverged somewhere along the evolutionary pathway from uh, other chimpanzees, we didn't actually lose our evolutionary competitional drive. Um, that didn't go away. We still have it. Now we've sort of mitigated it with some societal connotations, but in some ways we've just muddied the water. I was going to say, let's um, mitigate it in more... Anyway. We still compete <clears throat> for survival, for um, social status, 
and for mates. Um, and in particular, hormones shifting changes how we compete. Um, and then filtered through our social structure, we have the same thing happen to us as happens to chimpanzees and bonobos, um, where our social structure changes what that competition looks like. In orangutans, for example, competition is almost always violent. Um, in bonobos, however, competition is almost always nonviolent and incredibly sexual. Um, and looking at the testosterone balance in orangutans versus bonobos, it's working the same way. Testosterone ticks up and we see competition. What the competition looks like varies. Um, and the same thing happens in different cultures here in the United States and around the world. <coughs> so testosterone doesn't make you more violent. It makes you want to compete for a better place in social hierarchy. It makes you want to protect your place in social hierarchy as well. The, the correlation between this and violent behavior is cultural. Um, basically, testosterone primes people to attend to their position, to make sure that your position is maintained. If you are on the top of the imaginary pyramids of power, um, testosterone will encourage you to take advantage of your exalted position. Now, if you're in a culture that disdains violence and physical uh, cisgendered straight male entitlement, that still won't look like violence. It will, however, look at uh, create playing for favors and manipulating people into giving you things that maintain your social status. People who are at the top of the pyramid offer less and take more. That's what a high testosterone balance does to someone who's on the top of the pyramid. However, if you are on the bottom of the pyramid, a high testosterone balance will actually encourage submissive and placating behavior. Um, not aggressive or sexual behavior. Because it is um, what generates a competitive advantage. If you please the person on top, they may lift you up. We've observed this in wolves as well. A high testosterone balance in a wolf that has not established their position in the hierarchy will mean that that wolf eats less and placates more. Um, basically, they try to appease in order to rise up. Now, someone who is in the middle of the pyramid of power, who has a high testosterone balance, is likely to be very generous. Not the same way, it's not placating, they don't put themselves at risk, they don't give more than they can, but they are more likely to be generous. Now, this behavioral experiment has been done in a couple different countries. Intriguingly, one of the ways they did this was in Japan. Um, they created this game and they had a control group where they didn't give testosterone and a control group where they did give testosterone. And they could literally observe this structure of who gave more and who took more. And it literally divided along societal lines. So basically, only people who already have power when they have a high testosterone balance become aggressive, egocentric, or, or take risky strategies, or become sexually controlling to those around them. Otherwise, it actually does the opposite. Um, so one of the things they also found um, was that in societies where being fair, being even-handed, being generous is part <coughs> of social status where basically there's an idea that in order to have social status, you have to be a, a generous, um, good, caring person who takes care of your underlings. High testosterone balance increased that fairness um, just a, a great deal. So looking at this in, say, Japan, where you're supposed right. to be generous with your coworkers and you're supposed to um, give gifts and be, um, and they don't tolerate the same... Um, right, not that Japan is socially ideal, it's got its own set of problems, but it doesn't have quite the same level of naked aggression. 
Yeah. Instead, it turns into a game of I can show off what I can give you. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, let's talk about the estrogen myth. Um, so, the estrogen myth is that estrogen makes you more emotional uh, and causes you to uh, seek reproductive behavior. That if your estrogen is high, then that will make you want to go get pregnant and have babies and raise them and take care of them. Now, there's not been as many studies done into estrogen, and that's really a shame because they have found in a few studies that estrogen actually affects learning and memory, um, the affective state, so not just emotions, but how we take emotions and process them out and act upon emotions, motor coordination and pain sensitivity. Um, it, it affects our reaction times, it affects depression, it affects anxiety, and they're finding that reproductive drive is actually one of the more minor things that estrogen may affect. Um, and also they found that once again, people who are assigned male at birth and who have penises and who identify as male and who go about their life, their whole life calling themselves a man, um, can still have very high estrogen balances. Um, and so no, it's really, it is really not divided by gender. And one of the reasons we think that it was is that one of the very first studies into hormone function that was performed during the Victorian era, they did using urine. And if they got someone in who had a penis and was a man and said, and that urine sample had too much estrogen, they threw it out. They said, that doesn't make any sense. They threw it out. So one of the foundational studies literally thought they knew what the conclusion was going to be before they did the study and threw out data that contradicted their conclusion. Terrible science. Okay. So, um, the rest of today's this class... this is why you check your damn... Sorry. Side rant on science. Check the... F like, do, do the minimum due diligence of checking the foundational antecedents of the work that you're doing because in a disturbing number of cases they were bad um the fact of the matter is the very beginning of the field that you're studying was the very beginning of the field and probably had some assumptions going in may have had crappy methodology may have had crappy experimental design and probably hasn't been replicated since then because people were so busy trying to build on it. Go check. There was a really infamous one of these in physics um, having to do with particle decay, where by definition, what everyone had been basing their theories of um, radioactive decay on was bad data. If it had been good data, they would have gotten further decay in that experiment. Um, I think, do you know yeah, what I'm talking I do. about? Um, so, so anyway, minor side rant pet peeve. <laughs> okay. Whew. I don't know how far we're going to get on genitalia structure. Um, so we we'll spent we a great deal of time today talking about how there's no male and there's no female brains. When we get more in depth on transition and, um, how, because one of our classes in this comprehensive sex ed series is going to be about healthy transition, about myths, about what not to do to your body if you are going through transition, like please don't bind with ace bandages. No, really, they will tighten on the structures of the breast and cause all manner of health difficulties, including pneumonia. And no, that's not how Ian got pneumonia, although I have seen Ian in a really gorgeous dress. Um, the red silk one. That I um, spot you. Yeah. yeah. Um, where was I? Sorry. I remembered you in a dress and just my brain just whoosh completely. Oh, God. Now I'm blushing. Um, I have turned tomato red. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk about genital formation. Right. Woo. Before I move into genital formation, I'm just going to touch on something that will be touched on much more in depth when we get into <laughs> the class on transition. Um, please don't. Uh, Please don't think that this male versus female brain where I've gone on and on about how no, really, this binary doesn't exist. Um, 
at all applies to trans persons. If you are a trans woman and you've been telling people, no, really, I have a woman's brain, stop saying that I was born with a man's body, that is completely valid. Right. They have found that people who are um, trans have differences in the structure of their brain, in their, in their neural reaction to things that validate the idea that the trans isn't something where, where people can be like, oh, well, you have a male body or, oh, well, you have a female body. Um, no, really, trans is in the brain and it's right. they can look at it, it and is. they can see it, which as someone who comes from a people who were targeted with eugenics, I'm both really excited about. Right. And fucking terrified. I really, I love, I love when they're like, no, really, being queer, being trans, it's all genetic. And then I'm like, who's keeping the data of how to check? Like, yeah. what are they doing with that data? I'm sorry, I'm paranoid. I'll put a trigger warning at the beginning of the, the video that it, it um, mentions eugenics. Yeah, side note that, um, that anyone who's done an Ancestry.com DNA test, that information is available and for sale and freely shared with law enforcement agencies. So, you know, that's fun. Um, oh, God, a bunch of people signing up to like, never mind, I'm moving right along. Moving, um, my, anar so my poor I, anarchist heart. I, I have sort of an addendum to that. So, there are, we just got done talking about how there are no male or female brains. There are structures that you get that are essentially associated with cultural with cultural conditioning, and those are the ones that line up, yeah. basically. Um, also, I I feel the need to misquote Eddie Izzard. Okay. The um Eddie oh, the Izzard has thing. a great bit about no, they're not women's dresses. They're my dresses. I bought right. them. It's sort of well, yes, you have a man's brain. You're a man, and you have a brain. Like, right, like if you are a man, if you identify as a man, then you have a man's brain. Like if you identify as a woman, you have a woman's brain. Like congratulations. congratulations. Um, um, I thought you were saying that they're not a woman's dresses, they're your dresses. And I was like, but you're gender fluid. So sometimes it is a woman's dress. <laughs> um, not, anyway, not often. we got um, a little derailed there. Let's talk about people with penises. So uh, to start with, we're just going to cover biological facts um, because I think that's hey, important. Penises, they exist. Um, the hygiene class is a different class. So uh, penises may, may have been a great deal more intimidating once upon a time. There's uh, some evidence that at one point in our evolutionary history, the penis had spines. Um, and uh, human ancestors lost the prickly structures before Neanderthals and modern humans diverged some 700,000 years ago. Um, so that's just, that's just fun. A fun thing to think about. Yeah, um, that, that we, uh, we had spines. Now spines are still seen in certain species such as cats. Um, yeah. Also anyway. occasionally ducks. Occasionally ducks. Ducks and corkscrews. Okay, another relic that we've lost is the penis bone or the baculum. Um, though most apes have a bone in order to keep their penis erect, um, humans lost the penis bone at some point and now rely on blood pressure for stiffness. Um, in other animals, the penis bone sits inside the body and is pushed out into the penis for an instant reliable erection. It's still a bit of a mystery as to why um, as to why we lost the baculum. Um, one theory is that not having a baculum causes it to be easier to tell if your sexual partner is actually <coughs> healthy. Because if they cannot maintain an erection, then they're not healthy. Um, so, I don't know. Um, however, intriguingly, the loss of the penis bone has changed how penises can get broken. Yes, they can still get broken, and we'll get into that in a minute, but it is not as likely to happen as it is if you have a vacuum. Um, because bone. Right. So the penis has three main biological roles. 
One is the elimination of waste in the form of urine. The second is the means of transferring semen, um, which carries sperm from the testes out of the body to somewhere else. Um, and another of its functions is sexual pleasure. Uh, pleasure is a biological function. Um, and masturbation, uh, singular group, um, has been observed in bonobos, which are basically one of our closest living evolutionary relatives, um, and the ones with a societal structure closest to our own, in that they care for their elderly, they care for their young, um, there's not rampant sexual abuse like there is in orangutans, and yes, I know we have issues with sexual abuse in our culture, but man, orangutans. Um, so, moving right along. The penis, testicles, etc. Penises are born ready to go. Um, it is common for babies to exit the womb with an erection. Um, and even before the moment of birth, ultrasound scans sometimes show a fetus with a fully formed erection. It is also very common for babies to play with their penises. Um, and if you punish them for this, it can cause sexual dysfunction later in life. Um, what like we as clergy, not medical professionals recommend is that you teach children it is not appropriate to play with their penis um, in, in front of anyone. Yeah. Um, that that is a private thing for them. Um, and that if anyone ever encourages them to touch their penis in front of them, then they should immediately inform their parents. Um, and make it clear that that does not mean that they are in trouble, that they haven't done anything wrong, but, but that, that they that's, let someone know. that is something they need to let let someone know. We taught our, our kiddo by the age of one that there were no secret games. There are yeah. no secret games. All right. There is no correlation between the length while flaccid and the length while erect. None. There There is no no correlation. Um, that is a myth. Uh, the idea that if you're small, you'll be small when you grow. If you're big, you'll be big when you grow. Uh -uh. No, nope, it doesn't work that way. And it varies significantly across the species. Half of the penis is inside the body. Um, so what you see outside is actually only about half of what actually exists. Most people with penises have very little control over exactly when they ejaculate. The idea that you can use your brain to like control when you ejaculate is actually not very accurate because the brain does not control ejaculation. The signal to ejaculate comes from the spinal ejaculation generator. Um, it's in That's your spine and all those crappy fanfics and romance novels that talk about orgasm hitting someone with a penis as if they um, as if there's heat from their spine or as if someone has punched them in their spine. There's That's actually, actually some, that. some there's quite a bit of basis for that because that is what it feels like to a great many people who have penises. The, the region in the spinal cord coordinates the necessary functions for ejaculations. However, there's a couple of them. Yeah. However, um, you can distract yourself from the fact that you are having sex in order to delay orgasm somewhat. Right. So, okay. There. Let's start with one. Yes, in people with penises, orgasm denial or delay is a trainable skill. There are entire spiritual sects that are predicated on learning this skill. Um, <laughs> I have read so much fan fiction. Someone asked, someone asked how much fan fiction have you read? Mm -hmm. So right, much. Ninety percent of everything is so crap, much. And she's read a ton of fan fiction. Yeah. That. I eventually um, found that you could sort by like kudos and sort by bookmarks and like who all has recommended the stories. That helped a great deal. Um, but I got into fanfic when it still came in the mail. So. Um, um, what was I saying? Oh, orgasm delay, delay and denial in people with penises is a skill that can be taught. There are entire sects of spirituality based on learning this skill. 
But um, there is no way to just like there, program, like just switch off the part in your brain that says ejaculate because it's not because it's not because it's not part of your brain. Um, and ultimately, like yes, everyone's got a story about like my cousin's boyfriend or a. A buddy at college saw this guy do this thing of someone who could control ejaculation on demand that I'm not saying it's physically impossible. It just doesn't work the way that people think it does. Yeah. So, um, okay. all right. Penises, like I said, can so be... All those terrible Tumblr edging blogs are minus 10 out of 10. Um, penises can be broken. Penis fracture, as it is known, is actually the rupture of the fibrous covering of the corpora cavernosa, which is the tissue that becomes erect when engorged, engorged with blood. So it's actually, there are these tissues that fill with blood and become erect, and those tissues can be damaged. Kind of like, you know, kind of like any other portion of your body that is flush with blood. Mm -hmm can have a tissue rupture. Yep. So, sorry, I accidentally scrolled down. Uh, where am I in my notes? Right, okay. There is a difference found between the bacteria found on uncircumcised and circumcised penises. Basically, <laughs> they get different kinds of bacteria. Um, I'm going to get more into that when we start discussing genital mutilation and circumcision. But specifically, yes, there is a difference. However, a difference isn't necessarily like, so what they found is that more anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that does, that likes to hide from oxygen, exists underneath the foreskin, and more aerobic bacteria right. that likes to Not. exist in the presence of oxygen is on uh, the head of an of a circumcised penis. So it's this which not really surprise right. anyone. Not that one has more or less. So the average erect penis is about 5.56 inches long. Um, there was a study into whether this actually varies by race and ethnicity. Yes, it does, but not anywhere near how much people thought it was. Yeah, basic, it is, basically it's within one standard deviation anyway. Even taking like the most extreme numbers and racking up like huge amounts to measure, it's under a half an inch difference. Um, really. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, Catherine, there's, there's a reason that our information on circumcision is in the same section as our information on genital mutilation. We consider it genital mutilation. We'll get into why, and we'll get into <clears throat> some of the information that people are presented on to be told that you have to do this and it's better to do this. And I'm going to be debunking one of the most major things that people say is why you have to do this. So, yeah. um, but we'll get into that into the class on genital mutilation. Um, that one will be fun. Okay, so, uh, da -da -da -da. Penises vary between 1.6 inches long and 10.2 inches long. The standard penis varies from 1.6 to 10.2. Um, so there really is no like right size penis. There is no right or wrong. Um, Actually, um, so the, the top end of that scale can be considered wrong. Mostly because individuals, mostly because individuals with penises in that length tend to become unconscious in the process of attaining a full erection. Um, because which it reduces, is not a, which is not an evolutionary advantage. Because um, it reduces blood flow to the penis, smoking can shorten the average penis up to zero point four <laughs> inches, so almost a half an inch. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So smoking makes your penis smaller. Um, very rarely people are born with two penises, a condition that affects one in every 5 million to 6 million people. It is referred to as diphallus. Um, unfortunately, this condition does not generally mean double the phone, the fun. Both organs are rarely fully functional. 
The condition often comes along with other anomalies in the genital area that require surgery to correct. There has only been one recorded person in history who was born with three penises. So uh, the foreskin and the clitoral hood, uh, known in gender neutral terms as the prepus, um, evolve from the same tissue in the womb. Um, so what becomes the clitoral hood and what becomes the foreskin are the same tissue. Um, when babies are born with penises, the foreskin tissue is fused to the glands of the penis. The foreskin's inner surface is made up of a mucous membrane, which is similar to what is found inside the eyelid or inside the mouth. Um, and uh, the foreskin has an abundance of Langerhans cells, the immune cells that get infiltrated <laughs> by HIV. Um, however, those immune cells are important for other things. So, da da da. Uh, we will get into more about foreskins um, when we talk about genital mutilation. Uh, but for now, we're going to move into people with vaginas, and I know it's carrying us a little over time. We're going to see how much information we can cram into five or ten minutes. Yep, and then we're going to move around. Um, so in general, there are surprisingly few depictions of normal vulva and vaginas um, the genital structure of people with uteruses, vaginas, vulvas in medical literature. Um, in contrast, uh, measurements for penises and testicles are widely available and have been published since the 1800s. Um, there have been very few reports on average clitoral size, average vaginal length. There's very little information on average lab labial size. Um, there's very little information as to average genital color. Um, this means that most of the information that we have to present is collected from collections of anecdotal evidence. Yeah, so there, there's very little information on internal size, position, relationship to surrounding structures of the clitoris. Um, there started to be more post-mortem dissections of external genitalia that is comprised of vaginas and vulvas. Um, I did find a couple of studies that have taken place in just the last 10 years, um, where they photographed the vaginas of very, very many people, and they measured very, very many people, um, and uh, it, it was fascinating. So the mean vaginal length was 9.6 centimeters with a but it had a huge range from 6.5 centimeters to 12.5 centimeters are you doing this in inches yeah for the record that is between 2.56 inches and what was the maximum 12.5 and 4.9 inches however they did find that these numbers might not be accurate because the vagina expands and it tends to contract when you are uncomfortable. For example, so, when you've got someone measuring Right. You. If vaginal length is measured in a clinical setting, that changes the dimensions that, will, that may occur during arousal or penetrative intercourse. So, um... It's something to be interested in if you are a person with a vagina that is considering um, undergoing treatment to increase the size of the vagina. You may not need it because if you are sufficiently relaxed, it may expand far more than you think that it will. Um, there's been a lot, and again, I'm not a medical professional. Please don't take this as medical advice. But there are starting to be some studies into um, vaginal constriction and marijuana. And they're finding that some people, upon having marijuana, uh, their vagina there's expands. There's also, um, I'm pretty sure there's a crack here about, oh my god, find someone who's actually able to get you turned on. Um, Wide variation. Wide variation was noted in the dimensions of the labia minora and the labia majora. So basically, and I really, I'm going to have slides at some point. Um, you have your vulva and you have your labia majora and then inside those you have your labia minora and then inside that you have um, your vagina. Um, the lips, the outer lips and the inner lips vary widely. 
Some <laughs> people have lips that all enclose and the labia majora close over the labia minora. Some people have labia minora that hang down. Sy uh, it appearing symmetrical is very rare. It's actually more common for it to appear asymmetrical. So the uh, porn perfect vagina is, is often, a rarity. Is often the product of plastic surgery. Yes, and we'll be when we get into genital mutilation, we will be we'll discussing the change the vagina to make it appear more. Uh, color variance is also fairly dramatic. Color variance was very dramatic. Um, smell was different from person to person. Um, there is a huge amount of diversity in clitoral size. Um, a huge amount of diversity in urethral position, where the urethra was, and um, how the muscles around it responded changed. Um, and they found that there was wide variation in homogenous ethnic groups. So there is no such thing as like a white girl vagina or a black girl vagina or a white person's vagina or white right. trans there's, woman's vagina. There's large um, variance within every ethnic, cultural, mm -hmm. racial group. It's not just that. No, and I've seen that racist shit online. I've seen the the people going like, oh, well, I want this kind of vagina that this ethnic group has. Mm -mm. Turns out there's wide variety in each ethnic group as well. All right. Also quit fetishizing. Right? Gross. Um, the vagina, the vulva, and the clitoris. There are 8,000 nerve endings in the clitoris, while the penis only has 4,000. Um, yeah. Circumcised or uncircumcised? You know, I couldn't find very many studies into so, how many nerve endings get cut away when you I, cut off the I foreskin. have access to that information. I'll I get would it like that information. Because before we go yeah. into genital mutilation, I knew it was significant. It is. Um, um, it's pretty dramatic. Um, powerful sp sensations spread from the 8,000 nerves in the clitoris to the nerves across the pelvic area and affect 15,000 other nerve endings. Um, during arousal, the depth of a vagina changes um, up to 4.7 inches. Um, so if you remember those numbers from earlier, 4.7 uh, 4 inches would be somewhere between 200% and 100% increase. Mm -hmm. um, now that's the maximum, but basically doubling to tripling in size, not uncommon. No. Um, or depth, I should say. The normal pH of the vagina is less than 4.5, which is similar to the pH of wine. Um, lactobacilli are the good bacteria that dominate the vagina. You are supposed to have bacteria in your vagina. They help to keep pH levels normal in the vagina and prevent the growth of infection-causing bacteria. When levels of lactobacilli fall, vaginal pH levels can rise above 4.5, um, which is the breeding ground for vaginal infections, such as yeast infections and bacterial vaginosis. Um, seriously, you are not supposed to smell like flowers. You are not supposed to smell like sweet sugar and spice. Vaginas have their own natural smell. And putting something up inside yourself to make yourself smell better um, kills off those bacteria and causes bacterial infections. We're not getting into hygiene right now, but oh my god, don't use antibacterial soap up inside yourself. We will be getting um. into hygiene as an entirely separate class. But please, don't douche. It is very bad for you. The first inch or two of the vagina has the most nerve endings and is the most pleasure sensitive. After that, um, many people with a vagina actually report uh, the sensation being rather uncomfortable the deeper someone gets, whereas other people with vaginas have reported that it is very pleasurable to them to have something striking their cervix. That varies. Different vaginas have different smells at different times of the day. 
right out of the shower, a vagina may not have much of a smell. After running or exercise, a vagina might smell musky from all of the sweat glands. A menstruating vagina may smell like iron, and when a vagina has an overgrowth of yeast, it sm may smell like bread. After intercourse, a vagina may smell faintly like bleach, as semen has a smell of its own and changes the vagina's pH. Um, if there is an overgrowth of bacteria, the vagina may start having more unpleasant aromas, at which point you should seek medical assistance, not douches, okay? It is quite common for the vaginas, uh, what is the word? I just completely blanked it, discharge to bleach undergarments. That does not mean that there is something wrong with you. It's quite common. Um, Sex should not be painful. Conditions that cause pain in the vagina include, but are not limited to, vulvar vestu vestibulitis, inflammation of the vestibule, vaginismus, um, involuntary contraction of the vaginal muscles, allergic reactions to things such as latex con condoms or spermicide, and endometriosis, when lining from the uterus gets on the ovaries, bowel, and pelvic lining. As people age, their lower levels of estrogen may cause atrophic vaginitis or the thinning of the vaginae, um, which can cause tearing during sex. And that is one form of pain. Uh, vaginal discharge helps lubricate the vagina. It is self-lubricating. Um, it is different than the vaginal lubrication produced during sex. Vaginal discharge is one kind of lubrication and also the way of the vagina to self-clean itself. Um, vaginal lubrication is a different fluid entirely. Um, and uh, I'm not even gonna tell you the gross thing that prompted me to go research that. Um, the lubricant produced by the vagina comes from special pea-sized ducts called Bartholin's glands, which are located around the vagina's opening. Vaginal discharge does not contain any waste product. Instead, it contains the following, fluid that seeps through the walls of the vagina, cervical mucus, uterine and tubal fluid, secretions from the glands in the vulva, oil and sweat from the vulva glands, old cells from the walls of the vagina, and healthy bacteria. Vaginal discharge contains mostly salt water, mucus, and cells. The average amount of vaginal discharge that a person of reproductive age secretes over a period of eight hours weighs 1.55 <laughs> grams, so a quarter... Um, very little. Very little. Every person makes different amounts of vaginal discharge, though it does vary depending on what, upon where that person is in their menstrual cycle. A person produces the greatest amount of discharge, 1.96 grams, around the time of ovulation. The, vagin the vagina is set at 130 degrees. The vaginal canal rests at an angle in the body. So if you've ever tried to insert um, a, a tampon and had it not go in right unless you laid down and like cocked your hips up, that's because your vagina does not go straight up in your body. It's tilted. Um, now the degree of tilt does vary because everyone is born with a slightly different pelvic shape. Um, and although you can break it down into six common pelvic shapes, and we'll get into this more when we talk about giving birth, um, those six different pelvic shapes that are common have a great deal of variance and it's a spectrum more than anything. And the pelvic shapes do affect that vaginal tilt. Vaginas are strong enough to clamp down on penises or other things that are inserted within them. This is known as penis captivus um, when it occurs to a penis. It is a rare occurrence during vaginal intercourse where the muscles in the vagina clamp down with intensity, which makes it impossible for whatever's up there to withdraw. However, you cannot get something lost inside your vagina you can get something lost inside your anus. Now you can get something stuck. It can go up and you can have a hard time getting it down, in which case, please, 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 please seek medical attention. Um, one of the things that my grandmother during her time as a, uh, a midwife, midwife encountered, just trigger warnings. This story freaked me out when I was little. Um, someone got something stuck and while trying to get it out, they scraped themselves up really, really badly 
and look at the end of the day whatever it is you've got stuck inside you is not going to be the weirdest thing that, that that emergency room surgeon has ever seen so when i accidentally swallowed something and it got stuck on my mm -hmm. duodenum um and i was really really embarrassed about it and i and i was talking with the er person he told me he said look we get people in here all the time with stuff stuck up inside them with stuff they've swallowed stuck in an ear stuck up their nose um, People and putting I, things and I inside orifices saying, that shouldn't be there is pretty common. What was the weirdest thing you'd ever seen? And he said there was a person who every few months was back to have Barbie heads removed. That this person liked to stick Barbie heads, just the heads, up inside their anus and that they would lose them. <laughs> And so, yeah, there were people out there sticking Barbie heads up inside themselves. Not just once, but multiple times. And so whatever you get stuck up inside you, they will help you. Um, anyway, let's see. Uh, honestly, attach a string. If you get off, if you get off on sticking Barbie heads up inside yourself, you get, you get on with your bad self, but you sterilize them and you attach a fucking string, take basic make, safety precautions. Maybe sand down the sharp edges. Yeah, just like basic also, safety precautions. don't use vegetables. No vegetables. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, contrary to, uh, to a statement made recently in a scientific article, uh, people with vaginas do have a prostate. They do. We found it. We've known this for a while. Or um, at least a prostate equivalent. <laughs> right. This is kind of like the definitional problem because if you define a prostate to be this particular gland inside an assigned male at birth body, then okay, fine. An assigned female at birth body doesn't have one, but it does have something analogous that develops from the same tissue in your Yeah. We've known this. <laughs> Since 1672. Yeah. 1672. When she says a while, she's not kidding. This drives me nuts. I was constructing this class and finding out how much stuff we know that we just don't teach people. It's called the Skeen's gland. It is two peri periuthral <coughs> ducts inside the vagina um, that are analogous or homo homologous the, it's homo homologous yeah um to the prostate inside someone who is assigned male at birth and possesses a penis um we have found these in post-mortem examinations of the urethras of people who were born with vaginas um they are of clinical significance um in that A, they can get adenocarcinoma. People with vaginas can get prostate cancer. So it's kind of fucking relevant. I mean, also for pleasure, because that's one of its purposes, but like, blah. Um, where was I? Uh, I wrote all this information on what yeah. they do. So in uterus, um, while we're diverging into people who are assigned male at birth and people who are assigned female at birth, um, the tissues that become the prostate gland become these tissues in, um, in the vagina that create ejaculatory fluid, just like they do in a person with a penis. <coughs> that ejaculatory fluid is not urine. I read this article by this oh, man, asshole who claims Wasn't that, that he's the guy a... Who was a fake? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm very brief tangent. Very There's brief someone tangent. who presented himself as an expert on sexuality. It turns out he made up his credentials. He made up his degree. He made up all of his lab experience. And, and he, he made, probably made up the and studies. And he made up the studies that he, he most likely made up the studies that he, because but the data doesn't make But he was the one who got sense. cited in a bunch of articles that were bouncing around for a while there that said there is no such thing as female ejaculatory fluid. I have an issue with the fact that he said a female ejaculatory fluid because, hey, non-binary person here. But, um, but specifically he said there is no such thing as ejaculatory fluid created by uh, a vagina 
those people with vaginas who say they have an ejaculatory experience are just peeing themselves. And I did these studies and I found urea. I found urea in all the ejaculatory Turns out fluid. Turns urea and urine are not the same thing. Urea thing. and urine are not the same thing. And I got so mad when I read this article and I started ranting to Ian. I was like, this sample size is small. This, this study is completely broken. How is he getting these people to ejaculate in a clinical environment anyway? How, like, how quickly were they testing this shit? What were the controls here? And also, urea and urine are not the same thing. And so, like, four years later, when it turned out this guy faked all his credentials and probably faked all of his studies, I was like, yes! <laughs> yes! I knew he was an ass. But, like, also, I really worry that those studies did take place with this asshole because right. he, he I, was concerning. Right, either way, um, it would be somewhat concerning. concerning for different reasons. Anyway, so, uh... Um, in particular, uh, here's where it pisses me off. And trigger warnings, discussion of rape, discussion of rape. They know ejaculatory fluid from the vagina is a thing. And it was literally used in a rape case in Europe to acquit a rapist because they said there was the presence of ejaculatory fluid from the rape victim's vagina. And if she ejaculated, then that meant she wasn't raped. Fuck those people, ejaculation does not mean you're not raped. And it is quite common to encounter sexual pleasure and ejaculation, even during sexual assault. This, this is actually one of the things that counselors trained to deal with sexual assault survivors have to know about and have to train to deal with because guilt complexes and all kinds of stuff come up among I kind of, my body betrayed me, basically. Yeah. So, no, fuck those, fuck that entire case and that poor victim, and you can absolutely ejaculate during rape. <laughs> and it bugs me that we only read about ejaculation from the prostate that exists inside the pro inside the vagina. In that in context. In that context. Yeah. Um, so, the it is located on the anterior wall of the vagina around the lower end of the urethra um it has numerous microanatomical structures in common with the prostate gland such as secretory cells um they are not identical uh however the ducts do lead to the surface of the vulva to the left and right of the urethral opening um where they secrete fluid which is a lubricant for the urethra, a lubricant for the vagina. Um, it's antimicrobial, which is fascinating. So it actually protects the urinary tract from infections and it swells during arousal. Um, so, it has been demonstrated that a large amount of fluid can be secreted from these glands when stimulated from inside the vag vagina. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of the studies I encountered into this were from people who had gone and gone through surgery in order to decrease the amount of ejaculatory fluid they produced. Um, so, uh, actually, we'll get yes. into that with. Um, We'll, we'll get into that with uh, genital mutilation. So we're almost done. I know I'm trying to run through this um, as fast as possible. I, I want to make a note about the scheme plan before you skip totally over it, which okay. is that um, G-spot is a terribly defined term. Um, but there are basically two candidates for what was, people are talking about. The next thing about. I was going to talk about was the actual size of the clitoris okay. and then the hymen myth. Okay, go for it. Okay, so uh, you can go ahead. I mean... Okay, there are basically two candidates for well-defined anatomical structures that people are referring to when they talk about the G-spot. One of them is the schemes gland. Um, the other, she's going to get to in a minute, but part of the reason that studies keep coming back and going, there's no such thing, is because, in fact... There's, they're looking for one thing or the other thing. Or... And it's likely that there's two, potentially three. So um, 
Number two is that the clitoris is way, way bigger than we think it is. Now I've actually ordered a 3D printed model. I didn't come in in time for today's class. So I'll have it, I'll bring it up when we're teaching, like this is how to give a vagina pleasure most of the time. Um, but the vagina is actually 10 centimeters. So that little piece that comes out of the hood is just part of it. And then there are two big parts that go um, underneath the labia minora and underneath the labia majora. And basically the front part of the vulva has these clitoral body running. And then it has a back body that goes through the anterior wall of the vagina, which may be what people are encountering when they're having pleasure from pressing on the, um, the anterior wall with a, uh, with a come hither wall gesture. Um, so they may be encountering the skein's glands, they may be encountering <coughs> the, the, the actual body of the clitoris, which is so much bigger. Seriously, look up 3D model, 3D printed clitorises. They're, they're the size of someone's palm. Um, they're much bigger than people thought they were. And uh, some people have pleasure from one and some people have pleasure from another. And then there's also these muscles and nerve endings that control contraction in the area that stop um, you from peeing yourself, right. that stop you from uh, from like where you clench up. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, there are some people they think are actually responding to the nerves that are being pressed on during gotcha. contraction. Unfortunately, to actually test that clinically, you would need someone with sufficient palpatory skill to distinguish between those structures who a whole bunch of people with vaginas consented to have finger them essentially in the name of science yeah um and these kind of studies have, study are so has, rife for abuse and yeah and, it, and being done improperly and it the clinical environment tweaks it anyway let's talk about the myth of the hymen and then i really will end this class for the night because we're like a half an hour over but i don't want to just stop so Hymens don't work the way that you think that they do. The way virginity is con constructed virginity in our culture is, is completely broken. So let's talk. Hymens have a hole already. That's how vaginal secretions and blood get out until the hymen retracts a little bit. Um, so basically the hymen, the membrane that, that goes over the vagina does not constitute like a, a solid barrier um and it now some people are born with one that is a solid barrier and it has to be corrected with surgery um because it's actually a, a problem that, that actually um, that needs, legit problems yeah. that needs to be corrected um but most people who have a vagina and that vagina has a hymen that hymen already has a hole now as life goes on there are things that can cause trauma to the hymen so accidents during sports uh, horseback riding gymnastics um basically playing with yourself masturbation when you're young can actually cause small tears and cause the hymen to retract a little bit away and that has nothing to do with penetration penetrative intercourse. Now, as a person gets older and more and more stuff happens in the area, that membrane starts retracting to the walls um, and, and basically creating a bigger and bigger hole. The membrane never fully goes away. So regardless of how much penetrative stuff you've been getting up to, whether that's with a partner or with a toy, um, the hymen still exists and can still get damaged and can still get torn and those tears can cause infection and those tears can cause pain, um, but it never fully goes away. Now the hymen also doesn't have to bleed at all during your very first sexual <laughs> interactions. In fact, if the person is sufficiently aroused and old enough to be having sex, That's a different conversation. Um, then it likely won't tear at all and there will be no blood. Um, so the, nope, the, the whole thing about popping someone's cherry, oh, if you didn't make them bleed, they're not a virgin. Oh, if you can't feel the hymen with their fingers, then they, they've been up to some shit. Nope, bullshit. Actually, it is a complete myth. So funny story. There is a long and storied tradition 
because there have been cultures throughout history where you had to basically de demonstrate that you could prick someone's hymen and it would bleed for the, a marriage to be considered valid. There is a long tradition of faking that test yeah. and of the old woman who administer it basically having some kind of bird blood or similar yeah. that they fake the test with because the woman was out riding a horse and it broke or the woman was right so whatever. one of the things Sorry. that midwives were taught person with person with a vagina. vagina one of the things that midwives were taught were how to help someone fake with uh thin goat skin and pig skin and with little blood, little, blood little bit of blood put inside uh, someone was this thing that doesn't really exist and it really it puts a really disturbing light i mean on the the sexual violation where people are performing virginity tests in um because you cannot prove someone's virginity by testing for a hymen it does not work that way by the time someone has reached adulthood their hymen may have retreated against the walls for any number of reasons none of which are having sex and if sex is done with sufficient relaxation and sufficient care, there is no reason for a hymen to bleed. Um, now, some people are born with thicker hymens. Yes. Some people are born with, um, with hymens that tear more easily. So when I say there's no reason for it to happen, I'm trying to correct the people with penises thinking that they fundamentally change someone with a vagina when they have sex with them and that if they didn't bleed then they weren't pure if you if you really went, wanted sex and were super aroused and were super into it and you still have bled a hell of a that lot can that can happen um if you were super aroused and you really wanted sex and you had sex for the first time and there was no blood that, that can, can happen, happen. If you were um, sticking a tampon up inside yourself and, and there was blood everywhere, that can happen. Riding a horse and, or riding a bike got kicked with a got kicked with a rollerblade, which was one of the things that happened to me. Someone kicked me in the vulva with a rollerblade and I bled everywhere. <laughs> like, yeah, um, trauma could also play a factor in that. Yeah, um, um, but there is no right or wrong way to have a hymen there is a right or wrong way for a partner or partners to handle you having a hymen you do still have one regardless of how much penetrative intercourse that you've had you do still need to be careful with it because of the aforementioned infections and things and no really virginity is a social construct there is no such thing as like your cherry getting popped and I really really hate the name of the band cherry popping daddies um on that note on that note I think um, that's everything for this evening so so the next class to we'll go up in probably, this will probably be hygiene be, depending on whether we get to it or not it'll either be general mutilation or hygiene okay um so have thank night, you for everyone. tuning in and, you know, let us know if there's something you want this series to cover. Um, right. There is a truly enormous amount of information that goes into comprehensive sex ed. Um, if there's something you want to make sure is in the series because you have trouble getting answers to it or you haven't learned it and you want to know about your body or someone else's body, your bodies in general or sex in general or whatever, Drop us a line. We'll make sure we include it. All right. Like the goal is to be as, as inclusive as and comprehensive as possible. Good night, everyone. Have a great night. Be safe out there.